Hello, thank you for watching. I'm John Windsor Cunningham. How to choose a really good monologue that works. When you're doing a monologue for an audition, there are other people auditioning, quite a few of them usually, and someone has to sit through and watch them all. And it can be incredibly boring sitting through watching lots of people doing a monologue. Not very long ago I had to sit through 35 people doing a monologue. It was in a rather nice theatre in New York. Uh, there were casting directors and agents all sitting in their comfortable seats and 35 people came on and they each did a monologue one after the other. And it was just so boring I wanted to kill myself. Not quite, I didn't really want to kill myself, but very closely, because every single one was exactly the same. Imagine it. Imagine watching 35 people doing a monologue and it's exactly the damn same. Imagine what that's like for the person watching. Of course of course we're bored. They're exactly the same. It didn't make any difference whether the person was tall or short or big or small. It didn't make any difference what colour they were, for God's sake, of course. It didn't make any difference whether some forgot their lines and some remember them all. They were all the same. Anyone could have got the part in a way that they might have been casting. They were all the same. And whatever monologue they were doing, whether it was about hating men or being at war in Afghanistan or wanting a divorce or having a baby or whatever the monologue was about, they were all exactly the same because when every person came out, when every person started talking, they did it in exactly the same way because you knew from the first moment they started talking that they were faking. You knew it immediately. You knew that they were doing some lines which had been written at some point by someone else. They were repeating something they'd read somewhere and worked on, were trying to pretend that it was them saying the lines. It was nonsense. Everyone was doing it. Everyone. You were just seeing one person pretend, and then another person pretend, and then another person pretend. It was all a waste of time for me. It was awful. And then one person came on. One person came on. And he did his monologue, and it seemed to be about him. All the others, they'd come on and done things about... One was doing a monologue about hating men. And she hadn't worked out that she actually hated, I don't know, um, certain kinds of insects. So think of, they think of a man as being an insect. And yes, he's just an insect. And then, yes, if it's in you, then that's in you. That's your feeling, and it'll be true. But they were all doing things as they were just reading someone else's lines and pretending. The monologue has got to be about you, or you've got to make it about you. You've got to know how to make the lines about you. The person who was doing a monologue about wanting a divorce was screaming it at this guy, and it was all nonsense. You knew she didn't want a divorce. She should have been crying and making it quite clear that she still loved the guy and she didn't want a divorce. But you've just got to work on things so that you make the speech about you. All of them were... It was just excruciating. 34 people, one after another after another. It's so boring to watch. All of them. All of them exactly the damn same. It's just a waste of time. You've got to go out and do some work. I know it's going to be wonderful when you're successful and you've shown people you know how to do it and you get jobs and you're earning good money. Now's the time when you've got to go out and do some work. So look up screenplays. Don't watch the bloody films because you'll just copy the actors. Look at screenplays and plays by the dozen, by the hundred if possible. Find things that are about you. That you look at them and you think, yes, I know what that's like that you know what it's like, so you can make it about you. There's a part in a play of Shakespeare's about a man who loves his dog. He's called Lance. It's a wonderful part. Now, I don't like dogs, unless they're belonging to a close friend of mine. I don't. I don't like dogs. But when I was seven, I had a dog, and it was the centre of my world. I had it for a day before it was taken away. It was the centre of my world, man. Centre of my world. I can still remember that. And I can remember it now. And here I am in the middle of the coronavirus period. And if I had that dog here now, 
that dog would be as important to me as my best friend. <laughs> I'd love that dog so much. I can do the speech about Lance, this character of Shakespeare's, loving his dog. I can do it because it's about me. You've got to do a speech which is about you. That's what you've got to find. Otherwise, it's just nonsense. When this one guy came on in the end and did his monologue, you didn't think he was doing something he'd written, but it didn't seem as though he was doing something that someone else had written, like all of the other damn 34 were. I'm sorry to sound angry and bitter and, and unkind about them, but it was just so awful to sit through and watch. When all you've got to do, all you must do, is go out and find some monologue that you can look at it and you think, oh, I know what that's like. I know what that means. Or I can work out a way with some help to find out that it's like me. Is you've got to do that. Find a monologue that is about you. Or make it about you. That's what you've got to do. So look through loads of them. Don't expect someone else to tell you about it. They don't know who you are. They don't know what your memories are. They don't know how you think. They can coach you if you've chosen something wrong and help you. But you've got to find something that's pretty well near to you to begin with. Some corner of you that is right. Find a monologue. That is about you.